and welcome to another thrilling episode of Adventuring Academy, the podcast where we talk about all things tabletop and how to run games at your table. Gang, to, to say the episode today is long awaited would be the understatement of the century. I'm about to introduce our guest. Never before have I been more certain that an introduction was not needed in any way, shape, or form. There is no fucking way that you are watching something I am in without being 100% aware of who this person is and being her biggest fan in the world. You know her as Fig Fayette from Fantasy High. You know her as Moonshine Sybin from Campaign One of Not Another D&D Podcast. Uh, uh, she's the uh, co-host of 8-Bit Book Club. You've seen her on Hot Date, which she co-created with her husband and comedic partner Brian Murphy. You know her from Adam Ruins Everything. She is the musical mastermind behind Nad Pod. Uh, and also, I'm just gonna I'm gonna give a shout out to something that only I will be aware of. Uh, a former team member of my favorite improv team at UCB as a student, Ragnarok from Harold Knight. <laughs> Woo! Deep cut. Please welcome to Adventuring Academy, Emily Axford. Thank you so much. I really think that is maybe the nicest introduction I've ever had. And I wasn't expecting it. I assumed that as my friend, you'd just be like, hey, you know who it is, it's Emily. And then I'd be like, hey, what's up? <laughs> no, we have you just like walked me, you just held my hand and like walked me through the hallway of my life with every single life stage in a beautiful gilded frame picture. And I'll tell you what, it was a nice walk. <laughs> so happy there are hey listen i didn't put the things in the frames that was you and your marvelous <laughs> life that did that so uh everyone watching is of course familiar with emily's work emily uh welcome to the show thank you so much for being here uh thank goddamn so having me going against your principles and having me <laughs> uh i far be it uh, uh, au, au contraire uh, having you on the show is a direct alignment with my principles, which are talking to uh, uh, D and D luminaries of all shapes and stripes. And who could be more luminary than our guest today? And I want to start our discussion about this noble game that you and I have played together so many times by going back to something that has been mentioned on the vodcast many times before, uh, a momentous conversation that felt auspicious to start with today. <laughs> At a rooftop party in Hollywood, uh, uh, and now some three odd years ago, um, uh, which I think was the first time you and I had really chatted. Uh, uh, this is a moment yeah. that you you can draw a direct line from this moment to me getting hired at, at College Humor from me mm -hmm. t uh, uh, introducing you and Murph Dungeons and Dragons and thereby yep. draw direct lines from that to not only <laughs> Dimension 20, but also NADPOD from yep. this one five one, minute conversation. This one aggressive conversation <laughs> in which, I mean, I think I've said before, like for me, it felt like this fortuitous moment that like, D and D, which I had been trying to play, I had played Call of Cthulhu. I I, I liked it, but like felt like the system wasn't good. And then the fact that it came up, I was like, ah, this is fate. But now, like having hung out with you, and also being this way myself now, D and D comes up pretty easily with you, <laughs> as it does with me. So like at the time, I was like, ah, yes, the fates, they are plucking their strings and I will dance to their song. But it was like, it was, it would have happened in a lot of different scenarios. Right, that's a, what you, what you, I think, yeah. Statistics change based on your vantage point. It's like, what are the odds that I would have found Brennan at that party right when he was talking about D&D? &D? And it's like, adjust your probability. I'm always talking about D&D. &D. So really, it's just, when were you gonna run into me? That is the variable. I am too. So it definitely is, I mean, spoilers for a sophomore year, but it definitely is sort of like the Kalina STD. <laughs> just a little bit of contact and whew, it moves on down. Um, truly, well, I wanna talk to you about like, um, uh, cause you and I have uh, uh, a lot of similarities in terms of sort of how we came up through the comedy track, both of us being like UCB alums, college humor cast members. Um, 
what was your like how cool you said you played call of cthulhu uh what were it sort of the brushings you had in terms of general nerdery growing up and and then like you know sort of like discovering performance and comedy parallel to what would later be like actual D and D. Um, so I guess like I, I was always, when I was a kid, my dad really likes a lot of that nerdy stuff. Like he was like, you know, what's t technically considered nerdy. Um, uh, like he was really obsessed with Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. So they always showed us that, but he also was obsessed with magic, the gathering. So like when I was a kid, it was just like me, my brother and my dad playing magic, the gathering all the time. He also loved all like the final fantasies. So like that was kind of like my introduction, like Final Fantasy, specifically six was like a huge influence on me because I was obsessed with the music in it. And I would go, I would save different, uh, save at different places in the game so I could go back and listen to those songs. So it's like that, you know, Final Fantasy obviously is very fantasy. So all of that was in my childhood. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I, I would say that was probably my introduction. But so it's like I, I had this fantasy interest, but then I also really like, I guess maybe like, you know, I started out doing comedy, but I think that the thing I've always been drawn to is not necessarily comedy, but just like kind of creativity, because that just feels really always fun and surprising. Uh, so improv for me wasn't like, oh, I want to make the best joke. It was like, oh, let's like walk out off of a ledge and see what catches us. <laughs> that is so <laughs> perfectly said i've often had that that's I, I i can't tell you how much i vibe with what you just said because i feel like that perspective is not a common one amongst at least the people that i was coming up with at ucb yeah. and i would often keep that very quiet to myself because i feel like you meet a lot of comedians that are like dude there's only one thing i care about and it's fucking yeah, making people exactly. laugh if it's, it's funny, it's if, funny. If it's funny, <laughs> it's funny, dude. It's fucking funny, it's funny. And I always felt a little bit of like a black sheep because I would be like, I would be like, listen, I can really enjoy myself if we say that the goal of tonight is to go make people laugh. Cool, groovy, I can do that, that sounds fun. But if we wanted to say, make them cry or make them very afraid or do some other kind of experience, or if we just wanted to go tell a really thrilling story, all of that's groovy as well. Like I used to tell people when I first got onto Herald Night, they'd be like, what's your improv background? And I would be like, LARP camp. And I would say like, I'm LARPing on stage <laughs> like more than I'm like doing in, I'm like in this Herald LARPing my ass off to keep up with all these <laughs> all these comedians <laughs> like, it just like feels like a Zach Galifianakis movie just like a LARPer <laughs> lost in an improv set <laughs> <laughs> really I mean truly uh, uh, you're not wrong. Uh, but, but that really, like, like I loved my time performing at UCB in New York, and it was really, really engrossing. But I definitely hear what you're saying, that, like, for me, the like, um, I always had as much fun in improv rehearsal as I had on stage. Because to me, oh, it wasn't... Agreed. Absolutely. It was, like, the creativity is what I love. Yeah. Like, the, like, I enjoy making stuff up with all you guys. And if that happens in front of an audience, groovy. If it happens in a, you know, a room in Shetler Studios somewhere, that's also totally fine, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, I think it's, like, the thing that I enjoy the most is just uh, surprising yourself, being surprised by other people. Just, like, once you kind of tap into... Uh, that improvisational creative mindset, weird stuff comes out and you're always like, I don't know where that came from. What did I just flirt with? Something just, but like something weird just happened. <laughs> yeah, you, you find there's something very exciting about finding out who you are and who your friends are. There was some psychologist who said like, the best way to get to know somebody is to play with them. Like, like you are showing a, a very true facet of yourself when you get into that play state, when you get into the state of like, look at my impulse choices. Like, I don't have time to manufacture a facade when I'm playing with you in the moment, like you're really seeing uh, uh, a core of who I am. And even if I'm playing a villain or I'm playing a hero, I'm doing whatever else, you know, you might be seeing me play a character, but you're still seeing the choices that I make when I don't have any time to think of something else. Yeah, um, yeah. 
which I really, really love. And then, yeah, and that idea of like surprising yourself as well is something that is equally fun in D and D as it is in improv. Um, yeah, I think I also like maybe I also respond to something about role playing like a character, not saying like ah these are their affectations, but rather like role playing their choices because their choices will surprise me too. Yeah. Um, and so that feels really fun because it's just like, who are you? Do you really exist? Like, it, <gasps> like sometimes it feels so alien from you that you're like, but you're like, just like, well, this is what they would do. So I, I kind of like, there's, I don't know, there's just something. I, I think I like to go to hippy dippy places and be like, ah, oh, they really exist. And I get to <gasps> ask them for but a moment. <laughs> I Love that. I Listen, you don't have to qualify it for me. When I first saw The NeverEnding Story, of which the, the premise of Fantasia is everything that has ever been imagined is real. It's just not real in the real world. It's real in Fantasia. Little yeah. eight-year-old Brennan was like, and I will sign off on personally believing this until... <laughs> 100%. Yes, that jives with me. <laughs> Wonderful best of both worlds. Literally the best of both worlds scenario for me. Great. Um, uh, but I think that that's really telling. And I want to talk about this too, because we we have had a lot of guests on the program who whose work is like, uh, very notable, but sometimes I can't necessarily speak to personally, which is not the case here because we've played a lot together, uh, both with me running games for home games that we've played in uh, with Dimension 20. Also, The Honor of a Lifetime, which was playing your brother in Mad Pod <laughs> Campaign 1. Spoilers for uh, Campaign 1 of Mad Pod. Truly some, some of the most fun I've ever had playing D&D in general, and certainly as a PC, my goodness. It was just so, so fun to come in for those couple of episodes. Um, but... Uh, we have had uh, a lot of people uh, on the show that can give, um, you know, advice about running the game. Um, what I want to talk about is you are someone that has a not only, by the way, spoilers for for stuff, uh, but um, uh, Emily not only has been DMing some content for NADPA. I was in the awesome Solstice one shot that Emily did, but you've also been telling me about some home game stuff you're DMing, which I want to get into later. Uh, so not only do I want to talk to you about DMing, but I also want to talk because I feel like you have some of the best insights into making the game fun as a player I've ever heard. When we have talked together about playing and your philosophies about how you think about your characters, what you see like your role as when you're playing the game, because I think that there is, and and I think that you've probably maybe seen <laughs> people who ask questions to, to you, you, like the NADPOD crew as well. When people talk about D and D, there is this tendency I've seen for people to be like, the DM is weaving this story that is being consumed by the players who are kind of like picking up breadcrumbs of the DM's story as they go along. That is so the opposite of what I think makes D&D &D good. And it's also something that I feel like at no point, even from the first time I played with you, were you under that misconception of how the game was supposed to work. <laughs> That you have always been like, no, no, like, like from your seat at the table as a player, you are supposed to be helping the story go along. Um, uh, what is like, like, what are your thoughts uh, for people that watch this for like the things that a player can do to make sure a that they're not like wearing their DM down by just being kind of like <laughs> passive a passive consumer of story. Like, what is the role of a player character as a storyteller at the table? Oh, wow. Um, I would say, I guess like to, to just respond to some of the stuff you were saying, I think that like, you know, in improv, you make a choice. And if people like it, then you're like, okay, cool. I'll lean into it. So I think with, with D and D, it's like a little bit more like, yeah, you make big choices. If the DM likes it, all right, I'll do it a little more. If the DM doesn't like it, then, you know, put it away. <laughs> That's your toy. Play with it on your own time. But, like, I mean, like, I think about it, like, I, my DMs have always, like, I tell what, I can tell what they like. I know also that, like, it's not fun to just talk at people. You want a reaction. Like, you want people to laugh. You want people to, like, nod along. You want people to engage. And so, like, 
sometimes it it works for a podcast thing, but sometimes I even make jokes just to, sh- you know, show like that, like, this is all fun for me. We're all hanging out. Um, but like, uh, in terms of like, I remember in our home game, uh, you gave me the, you gave my character the, um, you gave my character some tome that let it speak <laughs> to stones once a day. <laughs> And you seem to, and like, I was like, all right, I'm going to immediately talk to every fucking stone I can. But it's like, we were all loving that. You were clearly like loving it in that begrudging way that the DM is like, okay, I secretly love this. (laughs) It's like something like that happens and you're like, and you're like, okay, this is, this is fun. The DM's having fun. We're all having fun. Let's, let's ride it till it's not fun. Um, And then, yeah, I think like in terms of like, I also think that like from having, from having DM'd now, like, uh, I care so much. I care. I don't care about my own story. I care about what the PCs do. So it's like, if they throw out a random joke that says like, oh, I really like, I really like this. Then it's like, cool. I'll throw that your way. It's like really helpful. Anything that you can improvise about your character like that's like a little gift for your DM to be like, oh, you care about that? I'll put more in this world, you know? Well, if I had to give like a, a Latin motto to like the Emily Axford school of player charactering, like care about the world, care about the fantasy would be probably like the motto I would choose because that one action Like, I remember sitting down to play in L.A. for the first time with the home game and immediately the degree. So so Emily's PC in our long running home game, um, Wolfina Clawpaw, a.k.a. Swampina. Swampina. (laughs) Swampina. um, A wonderful gnomish druid. Um, Well, I just remember how easy it was to propel the story forward because your player character immediately was falling in love with things in the world with like rose who was the healer sort of like vil- like village hermit witch woman at the edge yeah. of town and the i cannot tell you how effort like it, b- before we were playing together it was this thing of like oh that's such a rare quality in players that before I wouldn't have been able to articulate it how much harder it makes your DM's life when you as a player aren't forming attachments to things in the world. Yeah, like absolutely. That, like, and that's something that I think ever like you've played some radically different characters in the different campaigns that we've done. But the one thing all of them have in common is they form really strong attachments to the things that they love. They form really strong like like rivalries or like enemy ships with the things that they are against or do, or stand against. And yeah. th- I just think that's like the best advice you could take from like watching yeah. your characters in the different dimension twenties. Is that something that like, um, uh, cause it seemed like that was something that was sort of second impulse from your improv training when we started playing, but like, were you aware as you started playing D and D that you were doing that? Or like, is that something you make a conscious effort to do when you're playing? Um, I think that, I think the thing that I do to make a conscious effort is to try to fill like the, I think that is just something that I naturally do. It's like, why would I play this game if I'm not going to engage with it? Like, I'm not playing that. Why would I play this game if I'm not going to watch other people's stories? Why would I play this game if I'm not going to care about something? Uh, so that actually is very good advice just because sometimes people like if, if you want to do something nice for your DM, make sure that you know what your player cares about and say it and make it clear. <laughs> it's because so good. definitely we've, I've gotten like, cause like we'll, we'll answer questions uh, on uh, for NADPOD and we will get questions. That's like, how do I make my players care? Like, I don't like, how do I get my players to like say what they want? So it is kind of like, if you want to be a good little PC, just make it really clear what you want. <laughs> Well, and I think that's what it comes down to is like, look, I like, I think that there there is a culture within the D&D space of kind of giving, you know, laudatory pr- praise to dungeon masters for these set of skills. And look, who don't love praise? I like praise. Praise is great. <laughs> but... 
it really is not in keeping with the level of skills that make your favorite actual plays possible from uh, from the PCs at the table who I don't see the same level of articulation. Like if I do a bunch of voices, that's something anyone can see and go like, wow, look at Brandon do a bunch of voices. The skills that make a player character really hold up their corner of the sky in terms of bringing a world to life are often and like subtler and I don't think they get the praise that they deserve in terms of something as like in other words long story short I have played at tables with PCs that were not not into it weren't forming attachments to the world weren't like making decisions about how their characters felt about things and let me tell you for all my fucking bag of tricks those sessions were bad <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the thing is like the idea that it's the DM's job to engage you is, I mean, it's not that that's wrong. It's the DM's job to, uh, it's the DM's job to see what you like and, and, and try to give you an, it's the DM's job to give you an opportunity to like be your coolest self. But it is not the fucking DM's job to tell you what you care about. It's not yes. the DM's job to tell you what you're what you want to do, what you're here for. Yes. Like that is those are all decisions that you need to make yourself, you know? And the story is gonna be way better if you come in being like, This is what I fucking care about. I have a strong opinion about you. I have a strong opinion about you. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, right? Because I can't tell you how much easier the job of a dungeon master becomes when you have player characters that are giving you that moment to moment feedback, which is what you're saying when you're when you're talking about like like you're saying like, oh, I'm reading the DM and saying like, do you is that choice? collaborative and fun or is that choice and it's like it's 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 very to use a weird analogy it's kind of like how bats use sonar it's like i make a noise so that the noise bounces off of the things around me and comes back to me and it tells yeah. me like the space that i'm in that is extremely happening on the other side of the screen. It's the exact same thing the Dungeon Master is doing as it's like, here's an NPC, here's an adventure hook, here's a new setting element. Yeah, what Do are you they like attaching to? Okay, they, I know, like, because I've uh, just DM'd something for, uh, for NADPOD. We had, like, basically kind of, like, you know, buying Murph some time to build his world and whatnot. Um, and it was super fun, but in the very first episode, out of fucking nowhere, they established that they watched all three Matrix movies. <gasps> Wouldn't shut up about the Matrix. So I was like, all right, I know that any time I do something vaguely Matrix related, they will care. And it fucking worked. They all, they all fucking, okay, they want to buy sunglasses? Cool. Oh, look at that. There's Matrix sunglasses you can buy. Then they all care so deeply about their Matrix sunglasses. Give me a luck check to see if the fucking Matrix sunglasses got broken in that fall. You know, it's like, it's like, I could have, as a, like, if there, there probably could be a DM. If it was all about the DM story, I would be like, this is inconvenient. This has nothing to do with what I want to tell. But it's like, you know, it, for me, I was like, this is a boon. This is what you care about. Let's just, let's, like, now I know how to make you care about something. Yeah. I, and I think that that, that is something that, um, Often, like you're saying, people can articulate it, especially when those questions like, how do I make my PCs care? And I think that that is something that, that just talking about this today is really consequential when it's like, to a certain degree, and it's bad news for DMs, you need to have a conversation with your player characters because this is a potluck and caring is the responsibility of the players. Like that's what they yeah. have to, they have to bring that. And if no one is offering that, it, it's to me, it's the equivalent of a DM coming with like no adventure prepared. Like it's the, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, I don't really have any notes. I don't like, we'll, we'll stumble through it. That can be okay every once in a while, especially if you're doing a very casual game. But like the idea of, of if you haven't given your player character, and it's again, again it's, it's not about writing a tremendous backstory because I feel like your characters both have that in their backstory, but also you have no problem in the moment being like, that rules. My character loves that and is very attached <laughs> to it. <laughs> like with the most recent thing with all the psionics, I was like, oh, fuck. Now, 
a spoiler for our, our one shot, but we did that one shot. And like, I know that like, I, I think that people think that psionics isn't cool. I've read through the psionic sorcerer. That's a cool class that you could make a fucking broken character with. <laughs> So when you were doing that all, I had like just been reading through it and I was like sitting there as Fig being like, oh shit, they can have, they have telepathy. If I had telepathy, I could fucking broadcast to a bunch of people. Is Fig gonna fucking want to go to college now? This is so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing is like that one shot is so, it's just so great because there is that aspect of something. It's like, it's like having a volley. It's like sending the ball back and forth over the net and as a player choosing to, whether it's choosing to react, which is something you do in improv sometimes where you're like, oh, it's it's gonna be better if I just have a strong reaction now. Or honestly, as is the case a lot of times when it feels like we're playing games together or with other players in Dimension 20, not choosing to react, but instead choosing to be vulnerable enough that you're honest reactions are given a runway to come out in the moment. Um, which I feel like that that's a very like improv distinction where in improv it's like you are not fabricating your reactions. Rather, if most adults go through life dampening their emotional state down to be professional and be in the moment. And a lot of what being a performer about is actually kind of sensitizing yourself so that you are, it's like, no, no, I'm like way more in those, those little annoyances or little moments of joy or little obsessions that in a normal adult life would kind of get dampened down and flattened and ignored. I, as a performer, am training myself to notice them and really amplify them in the moment. Um, I think that's what I was going to say is that like in life, you have opinions about like everything. Yes! <laughs> you have so many fucking opinions swimming around in your head. Why wouldn't your player character also have them? You don't have to say them aloud. Uh, you could just whisper cool. And then yeah. it's like, okay, like, now we know that this character fucking likes that. <laughs> that's the thing is again, like, what you are fighting against when you're playing D&D is the thing you're fighting against in any creative endeavor, which is you're fighting against the blank page, right? You're fighting against the, the cessation of energy. And what amplifying all these emotions does, uh, and amplifying, not just emotions, but amplifying these reactions, these momentary formations of an opinion, where it's like some little stimulus comes up and you go, ooh, here's how I feel about that. Um, it creates a feedback loop and it ma makes the story feel effortless, that it just surges along. Like, I, if we go back to the beginning of Dimension 20, a, a distinction that I think Fig has um, early on that, again, I cannot describe how much easier a DM's life gets when players start to do this, is Fig was one of the first PCs as we were all like learning to play together and being in that first season, like, how's this gonna go? Fig's one of the first PCs that called for a scene when she was like, I want to go work things out with Galir. The, the sigh of relief from a dungeon master <laughs> when you are like, oh God, I don't have to write as much plot anymore. Like PCs are going so to- that, So the first time in your recorded D&D &D career that someone called for a scene, it was with Galer. <laughs> the character that we made exist. Nice. <laughs> the character that we squeezed out of you against your own will. It's actually not like that at all. It's just really <laughs> funny to play it like that since Galir is like it, that. <laughs> it's a total act. It's sort of like, the only, the thing about Galir is I fucking love playing Galir. It's so fucking fun to play Galir. But it's just so funny to me that in a world with Arthur Eggfort and Jawbone and these kind of like larger than life characters, the <laughs> universal, not only the PC's <laughs> favorite, but anytime I played Galir, they had to, the editors had to cut out the sound of the crew on the other side of the dome, <laughs> losing their shit. Anytime he talks, <laughs> just yeah. like, yeah, it's something about that sad, sad you know elf. That's another thing that you can do as a PC is like, if your DM is playing a character that you're like, this is a pretty funny character, we should see more of it. You just ask for more of it. You yes. invite them along, you, you know, like, cause your DM isn't gonna insert 
their fucking character in. They're not going to be like, he must follow you, you know? <laughs> like, so if you're like, ah, oh, this is really fun, because it's, it's kind of helpful as a DM to have someone there just to be like, oh, maybe this is going on. <laughs> Nice, nice. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, a little, a little voice for the DM to speak through from time to time is never a bad like, thing. Maybe you shouldn't eat that. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't eat that, but <laughs> it, no. Sometimes it's nice, and then you have like, hmm, you know, I, maybe I'll make a little check back here. Hey, it looks like I found a clue as the NPC <laughs> helper. Um, I know I'm revealing too many secrets, um, but, but I think you're very right, and and there there is that point of like. Um, Something that I think intuitively Fig was doing as a PC, and then also later I like Sophie Bikes and other characters. Like one of the things that I feel like you've done that has been a huge help to every season of Dimension Twenty is that there is a knowledge that a PC has a lot of power as a storyteller as well baked into the structure of the story because i think again it's this it's this weird idea of theoretically like the dungeon master like this power imbalance but there is that sort of genie aspect to it where it's like sure you can say what the weather is you can have a hundred npcs show up you can narrate that the earth cracks open but guess what motherfucker the camera follows us like <laughs> that's our superpower <laughs> Wherever I go and whatever I do, that's where the narrative goes, which is an incredible tool to use, in, honestly, in taking weight off the DM's shoulders, which, yeah. which sort of- I think of that's why I do it a little bit. And also like, especially with like reading, reading a DM, it's like, Murph is my husband. If he wants us to fucking move on, I feel like I can smell it on him. So there are times that I'll just be like, I'll, that I'll probably help him just by being like, I think Murph wants to, I think like Murph is like ready to be done with this or like there was specifically one time when we were like interrogating someone and he definitely wanted us to just be done. And so I was like, well, cool, I kill him. <laughs> I was like, read it on Murph's face. Like, I don't know guys, fucking move on. <laughs> that is so funny to me. I love that. I also love it because that's a very Murph thing to do as a player. So I love that you are Murph's yeah. Murph in a way. Um, <laughs> Uh, beautiful. Um, but I think that that is very like, um, there are great instances in, in the characters you play. And again, talking about this idea of like, embrace a strong feeling, have a strong reaction. And again, what, what I think is important about this advice is it does two things. Number one, if you play characters that have strong reactions, feel their feelings, form strong opinions about the world, it's gonna do two things. Number one, you're going to have way more fun. And number two, uh, uh, you're gonna take a lot of weight off the DM. And actually I'll throw a number three in there, which is the story from kind of the bird's eye view becomes vastly more compelling, right? Um, there are a lot of D&D &D adventures out there that feel, for lack of a better word, pro forma, right? They feel like, okay, here's a, here's a group of random heroes. Mm. There is a problem for which the motivation couldn't be more kind of classic. Like there's an adventure hook where it's like, okay, goblins are threatening the village. You six heroes want to stop goblins from hurting the village, right? And you have a bunch of PCs who go like, yes, I guess on the whole, I would prefer the village to be unburnt rather than burnt. <laughs> so let us quest, right? Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how sad it is as a DM to be running a session where you can feel that everything you're doing is going through the motions because nothing ever gets personal for the PCs, right? Mm. Um, and the the idea of, um, you know, like, and again, thinking back through it, it was like, uh, uh, when I was writing the story, for, again, big old spoilers for everybody, when I was writing the season, the, the arc for season one, it's like, what does Fig have? This deep internal conflict with her mom and the dad and looking for her dad. Like her first scene, she's like, she's like, is my dad the fucking nightmare king? I'm gonna find my dad. And, <laughs> 
<laughs> me knowing the Gorthalax mini is in Rick's room, I'm like, yes. We go to like season two with like Sophie Bikes, and it's like, what's her backstory? It's like, oh, well, the backstory is her husband and Dale. And I'm like, you know, doing my Grinch thing because I know I'm going to, you know, ruin everything. But I don't. Like, I don't get to do my Grinchy villain thing if someone hasn't made a character that is deeply stitched into the fabric of the world, right? That has vulnerabilities and shit like that. When you sit down to make a character, are you uh, uh, very consciously going, like, how do I give them relationships? How do I stitch them into the world? How do I give them longing or passion or betrayal? Or is that something that just like, like you can't even imagine making a character without those qualities? I think that, um, well, first off, I'm really, I don't know how to play a character that doesn't care about the other players because I am in a collaborative story. My whole fucking purpose is that we all tell a story together. So the idea that my story would be separate from other people is like, just fundamentally, I feel like I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, but like, I think that I end up finding my characters on their feet a little more. And it's probably what you're talking about, like being vulnerable and also kind of going back to sort of like, I feel like sometimes it is just like kind of cultivating like a mindset of how your character would feel, whether it's like a vibe or an essence or something. And then when you're in there, if you're just open you kind of start to find out bit by bit how they feel about shit, you know? Like something like Sophie Bikes, I wasn't like, ah, yes, she's a champion of women. But it's like first scene, uh, a girl's getting harassed. It's like, no, you don't treat women like that, uh-uh. You know, it's like, so like, I didn't come in being like, like, this is what she cares about. I just came in being like, I know who this one, I like just thinking as her, you know, like just sort of like thinking as her, not about her big things, but like, how would she feel about little things? Like, uh, and that's probably what I think about going into it. Um, and like, and then I, I end up finding it on its feet. But again, it's like a lot of it is almost like stepping out on a ledge. Cause it's like, uh huh. I ha weird. I have this strong reaction to this. All right. Well, I'm just going to be honest that this is my act, my reaction. I don't really know what it means in the context of my character, but we'll find out. I think that's so. That's such good advice, specifically because there that is the balance of playing a character that when you are a improvising it. Because I feel like that's something that is really hard for people that maybe are like playing the game but don't have a lot of like theatrical background to wrap their head around is this weird idea of like, how am I supposed to be someone radically different from myself, but also still being vulnerable in using my honest reactions to things, which I would look like, back when I was teaching improv at UCB, I would go over all the time. Uh, one of the best, the best pieces of advice I ever got was about like, um, a good character is like a piece of stained glass that you put over yourself, meaning that it is, it's not opaque, light can come through it. So so your inner oh, light. Oh, I like that. Isn't that great? It's like your inner it's like light. Your comes, light is shining the picture. But it it's, shining. Like, it's not a picture of you. It's just your light. Exactly. So it's your light coming through a new piece of stained glass. So it's if you think of like the light in your chest as being sort of like, you know, pure sunlight or whatever, that it's like, okay, this character is let's say they're a, a red piece of stained glass. I put them on, when the light comes through, the light shines out red, right? But let's say yeah. that I have a reaction that uh, that I get sad and so I turn blue. The light that comes out isn't still red, it's now purple. And there's this weird thing mm -hmm. of like, the, the beauty of it is this thing of like, yes, the character is different from you, but you're always still using your reactions, the character becomes almost like a filter or something. So it's that thing of you're playing like a tough guy character and it's like you have a reaction that makes you feel sad. It goes through the character. They are still gonna have that sad reaction, but it's gonna be filled through like, nah, man, I'm good. Like, I'm not sad at all. I'm fucking fine. You know, like- That's interesting though. I think I, I, think I experience it a little differently, which is mm -hmm. that I think that a lot of times the reactions, like the reactions that my characters have surprise me like they don't feel yeah. like so it's like it doesn't feel like it's my reaction going through a filter sometimes it just feels like it's their reaction and i have to like be true to it whoa i do that... see no i actually do <laughs> get what you... no 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 no. i love it 
I think that that's true, but I think that it gets into, it's this weird thing when you're talking about playing a character and really getting into the headspace of, I'm trying to think how to put it as like a, it's it's because you're also getting information back that comes through that stained glass as well. It comes through that filter of the character. And that's where I think I get into the same position you're talking about, where you get surprised by things. It's like, oh, that information, I'm like, if I'm playing a hyper-confrontational character, it is, I'm like, whoa, I reacted very aggressively in that moment in a way that I wouldn't have normally because not only are things coming out through the filter of this character, stimuli are also coming back through the character to me. Yeah, true, true. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, which I really love. But I think it's funny too, because it's, it, it is such a weird thing to, um, you know, you, you play a character that's very different from yourself. I think a lot of like, yeah, the characters I have the most fun playing, like when I play like someone like Bill Seacaster, where it's like, it, it's like, where do these wild mood swings come from? Like, that's still, <laughs> it's still me. Like the part of me that's like, clear my boy! And then blam, shoots him in the chest. is like some, like, I am surprising myself, so I do get what you mean. But it's like, <laughs> it's like it's 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 like how do you open up that highway? Like I feel myself like adjusting the operator switchboard in my own mind playing those characters of like <laughs> we're playing Bill. Okay, we are gonna have zero impulse control, so just set impulse control to zero. We're gonna set like id to one hundred. Um, <laughs> And then if I move to playing like Ida, it becomes like, okay, take your internal monologue and try to give that voice all the time. So being like, like saying the unsaid things of like, I'm saying this, like in real life, I say things all the time where I'm like, I hope the person thinks this is funny and that they like me when I say it. And just with Ida, it's just have her say that of like, <laughs> I've said this to make you friendly to me. I hope it works. Like. Jenny, you can't just throw out Ida's voice right now, okay? No. <laughs> please, oh, please, please, let's keep this professional. <laughs> you know what I think the difference is? Is that, like, you're coming at it from so firmly a DM, so you're oh, you are always switching between characters. I think that when you're the PC, though, you can kind of just let a mindset overtake you and have it be, like, completely not calculated and have it happen to you god that's so cool oh man that <laughs> sounds very cool <clears throat> um, <laughs> um no but i i love that and i think that that's true that you can get to those moments i speaking of being a pc and i and I, we do have to i want to move to talk a little bit about dming where I, I can already tell that we're going to go along today but the um <laughs> Uh, what what I wanted to to say is like um, one of the things that was the most fun about playing Dead Eye in Nabod and spoilers for for the Dead Eye arc in Nabod was it's my first time PCing in a long long time and you know I'm like making choices as this character and you as Moonshine were like because i my relationship to you as a dungeon master is all like oh man it's awesome that emily like creates strong enemy ships with characters and it's great that she falls in love with other npcs she asks for scenes to happen she's constantly moving the story forward which is taking weight off my shoulders and not only taking weight off my shoulders but spoiler alert a dm moving the story forward is kind of lame to an audience like it doesn't feel as fun <laughs> It's like, you can tell when the DM is like dragging and audiences, that's what people are used to in novels and movies is the main characters driving the plot. So it's always great when a character is doing that. I had an experience playing with you as another PC and you saying that thing of like, I my like core tenant is being there for my other PCs at the table. I had never put that together because I'm always, you know, distracted and eating almonds and taking care of my notes behind the DM screen. <laughs> But when I was playing with you at the same table and, and you know, Deadeye had, was like doing his spiel and yada yada. And you as Moonshine were like, this is heartbreaking. How could you be like this? And had this strong reaction of like, you've given up on life. And I was having my PC like seen in that moment. It was like rocket fuel. I was like, this is so fucking cool that like, someone is like seeing the choice I made and engaging with it, not just being like, yeah. you know, not being like, cool, that's your character. Okay, so what's up with this mystery, Murph? Like, <laughs> like 
can't imagine. But I mean, that's a moment that like, I definitely like, um, that was a moment that like, I, I, that, that was like a genuine, you know, if we're talking about like walking out on a ledge, it's like, I was mad at you because, and it was part of because you were my half brother. And I was just like, no, no, how can you feel this way? And so it's like, I just kind of followed it and was like, like, I, I could have just been like, oh, that's weird. Why would I be mad at him? Why would I try to uh, tell him to feel something different? But I was just like, no, stop. Yeah. Everything they're saying is wrong. I need this to be better. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like so important to notice that. And for me, it's like, it was very, it was a very reifying thing. Like, like that little stint on NADPOD taught me so many things about DMing because I just hadn't PC'd in so long. It taught me how much it sucks to roll low. Um, <laughs> which I, I was like, oh, this does suck. I hate this. Um, but uh, uh, it also w was very instructive because I was I like, I kind of love rolling low though. Oh, if it was heartbreaking. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it happens it too much, but like. Just like a, a nat one in like either a dramatic or a funny moment is just like. Yes, that is true. I think for me, it's like uh, my moments of being a PC are so precious that I'm like, please, you're like, please, <laughs> please be competent. Um, but uh, uh, but but you're absolutely right. And I think Deadeye has some really fun failures. And there's, I forget, there's some things that he fails on that are so funny looking back on them. Like Bones fall. I think, like, does he have like a grapple check with Paw Paw at some point where like he loses a bunch of ribs? Um, very, very fun. Um, but uh, the, the moment of, how do I put it? Like the moment of, um, having his choice be seen by moonshine, having this really honest reaction, it just made me go like, oh yeah, like how many stories do you, like like if this was Lord of the Rings, like the relationship between Sam and Frodo is so much of what makes those books good. A DM cannot do that at the table. Yeah. That is on the PCs to have those that's moments. Another, that's other good advice is just care about your other PCs. If you want to help your DM, care about the uh, about your other PCs. And then they don't have to facilitate a reason for you guys to be together. True. And that, that's such good advice. And it really was this moment of like reckoning with how false this, again, I really want to say that in D&D spaces, there is this idea of like, not not too prevalent, but enough that it comes up a lot of like, like oh look at the skill or technique of this DM, and it's really humbling to be like honestly the reason people fall in love with these stories is for all the reasons that they fall in love with stories in any medium, and a huge part of that are the relationships between PCs, which in that moment of Dead Eye connecting with Moonshine and me being like oh, her investing in him is gonna change his life, and I get or unlife in this case, and I'm gonna get to. <laughs> And I'm gonna get to role play through that. Holy shit, what a gift, right? Um, yeah, but at the same time, it is the DM does deserve credit for facilitating those relationships. Once they see them, leaning into them, giving them space, giving them interesting, like having, giving them interesting moments to play out in, you know? So like, yeah, the DM deserves a lot of credit. <laughs> of course. Well, I just think that it's one of those things that like, um, uh, listen, uh, uh, I, you know, DMs are great and, and, and praise me, please. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but it's just to say that, like, I think people are very good at articulating what it is that DMs do. Things, things are mm. very like con things that are concrete, like encounter design, plot twist, character voices, these things that are like, you notice when they happen. And these PC skills are often a lot more like, for, for lack of a better word, you're not seeing the work mm. as fla as flashy a lot of the time of like yeah. choosing to care, choosing to be vulnerable, taking that time to invest and form that relationship with another PC. And that- Especially you don't see like, like you're talking about like being seen, like a thing that happened in NADPOD that like made me feel amazing was really early on uh, Hard One, uh, Jake plays Hard One, Hard One just decides that the crick sounds awesome and is into the crick. And that's where my character is from. And the gift that was like the amount of credit that other players deserve for making each other look good. It's like him making that small choice to be into it just elevated my character so much. And like, as a player, I see that and I'm just like, 
man, I will play any fucking game with you. You are fucking great to be at a table with, you know, but like someone might just listen to that and not even notice like what a good, what good playership that is, you know? I think that's exactly it is good playership often flies under the radar for the same reason that like good improvisers make scenes look effortless where yeah, that like if jake came in and did like a really cool accent and had a really cool character that didn't give a shit about my character that would be worse playership than like him coming in playing a great character who also cares about the other characters a hundred percent and that i think that's so right and you can look at like the history of like even dimension 20 as well like as simple as like noticing when someone has made a choice. Like I think a lot about a moment that Fig really came to life for me in the first season of Fantasy High, which was that moment at the diner when she was like, I don't often say how I'm feeling. I I don't really wear my heart on my sleeve. And everyone at the table across the board was like, you absolutely do that. You (laughs) come constantly and you're like, whatever, I skate her away. And that moment was so joyful because like people don't realize what a gift gift it can be just to acknowledge what someone else is doing. Just to be like, I see you doing that. Like I'm affirming that your character has this fun behavior or has yeah. this thing that they keep doing. Um, I, I think for me, that was kind of funny. Cause it's like, we went in, we we're doing sort of the breakfast club. Uh, I, I had pitched you some weird characters that were not 80s character tropes. <laughs> we kind of looked at like oh what do we need we need like the badass we need the leather jacket wearing badass and so like I was like okay what is that person like and it's like the idea of playing someone who like doesn't wear their heart on her sleeve and doesn't connect with people well like I said fundamentally does not work for collaborative storytelling I don't think so it was really funny in that moment when I said it I definitely didn't expect everyone to be like yes you do (laughs) and I was just like all right well this is what my character is <laughs> and then it just made it such a, a fun game to always be like ah, look I don't open up easy but <laughs> <laughs> so so fun well I feel like we, that there's some really incredible player advice here which I'm actually ha- really happy we dove into because I feel like player advice almost never gets its day in the sun like, there's so much dedicated to like how do you run the game and it's like hey PCs are doing a tremendous amount of that and you need to acknowledge that. So like, I'm glad that we've been talking about like, how as a player do you run the game? Because you're running it too, right? Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, 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 Emily Axford, the Dungeon Master. Talk to me. Actually, I go by Dungeon (laughs) Dosen. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, hell yes. Uh, Dungeon docent Emily Axford. Um, talk to me about uh, NADPOD. Talk to me about home games. Uh, uh, well, the, the home game, I did a home game like at the beginning of COVID uh, just for a little bit for Murph and some of his friends. Um, but that didn't really continue because um, we got incredibly busy. <laughs> Um, and I started DMing for, uh, for NADPOD. I did like a a short stint. Um, but the, the home game was really fun because they're very much gamers. Like they don't really want a lot of story. They want cool encounters. So it was really fun just to be like, okay, I see what you like. Cool. You want to do lots of really cool stuff with your weapons. All right. I'm going to come up with all the coolest stuff that you can possibly do with your weapons. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But uh, but yeah, and then I and then I uh, DM'd a, a short thing with uh, with Zakoyama. He was a, a character in um, Nad in Nadpod, and his character got introduced by being like um, like he was like in a bad mood because his boys were all having a beach weekend without him. <laughs> And I always, I always said to Murph, I was like, that's such a funny one shot. We should do that as a one shot one time. And Murph was just too busy, and so I was like, all right should I, I'll do it as a one shot. It's funny. We should do it. It's such a great premise, like Mavericks and his boys at the beach. Um, and then, uh, I knew that I was going to be DMing a little stint for, um, at the end of the summer. So I was like going to do a one shot for that. And then another little mini campaign. But then I was like, this is such a fun premise. Like, let's just, let's really, uh, 
have more than one episode with this. So yeah, so that's how I did it. And then I, I DM'd and I, it's funny to see you like wax poetic and be like, oh, I, I miss living as a PC. Like, oh, I want to be a PC again. Cause I found it to be DMing to be like the coolest thing I've done in forever. It used, it challenged me in a way that like, like, you, you know, you can get really comfortable and it was so uncomfortable. Like it, I had to learn so much. I had to try work so hard and it was really, really fun to feel like I was working parts of my brain I hadn't used in a while. I just, it was really, really fun. I absolutely got bit by the bug. That fucking rules. Uh, uh, what were the parts that like, cause this is, this is, what I want to know. This is where my this is where my curiosity lies, right? So okay. you're coming you're coming with a tremendous amount of experience as a PC, coming with a ba huge background as an improviser, quick on your feet. You also have, a, let me just say, a an a complete mastery of the rules system. I routinely get fucking whomped bad by Emily Ashford characters. Um, uh, so but that's the thing, when you start to DM, you realize you don't fucking know shit about the rules. Every single fucking time I'm suddenly like, oh, I gotta give this guy his armor back? Okay, he's wearing medium armor. How long does, it, wait, that takes fucking five minutes to put on? So now I have to factor that into the battle? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing is, the biggest advantage that PCs have fighting the Dungeon Master, and the reason that challenge rating is totally useless as a metric is, the is if you take the numerical stat blocks, you're not getting the full story. Because the full story is each of these PCs loves their character and knows their mechanics front to back. You as the dungeon master met not this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's assume some PCs maybe have a, a more casual relationship with the rules governing their character. We don't need to name names here. Um, but but uh, as a dungeon, like I, I go dive deep into the rules. I love the rules. I love crunch. But even, even for me, it's like, okay, how much time am I gonna give to really cracking the optimization of this Flind or this Catablepass or some other random D and D monster? And it's like, my dude, you're gonna be alive for ninety minutes. I'm not gonna get to know you that well. Like, <laughs> like I'm not. I just can't take the fucking time to, to really <laughs> sink my teeth in. Um, yeah. uh, but so, so as you start DMing, um, uh, what did, did it feel like some things clicked clicked onto the rails right away for you? And what were the other things where you're like, oh, this is a really different muscle than I'm using when I'm being a player character? Um, I noticed that, and this is a, a funny transition. I noticed that I think I, I noticed that it was really hard for me because I didn't give a shit about NPCs and I had to like work to remember to put them in there and give them names and care about them because I'm I noticed I was very, very PC focused, you know? So like it, it became always the last thing. It's like, okay, what am I gonna do? I loved giving them items because I was like, oh, they'll be so funny if I give them this item. Oh, they'll be so funny if I give them this item. But I forgot to think that you can do that with people too. So like the people I always were, were just like, okay, well, they gotta fucking figure this out. So I don't know, this fucking person's there and they say this and then I just get them out of the way. I want them to play with toys and monsters. <laughs> I, so that was, that was it. I guess I wouldn't have expected that because I really like playing characters so much for PCs. But the second I was behind the screen, it was always the last thing I thought of. And I'm sure that as I, as I get more and more experienced, I'll, I'll find them more useful. Um, but the things that I w gravitated towards the most were monsters and items and, uh, and environments that I wanted to see them interact with. So yeah, I love that. And that is interesting because I feel like, again, as a player, you are so deeply engrossed in your characters. I think we were talking this before when you were like, oh, well, Brennan, you're like, constantly switching in the minds of these other people. It's so interesting to me that you would not have, it's like a, a little stable of these like little beloved, um, 
It's kind of like you know, like in the matrix. Speaking of the matrix, how like Agent Smith can jump from person to person and appear to different people. Uh-huh. That's like sort of what I love about DMing is that thing of like, oh, I have a little like roster of beloved people that I can like teleport into. And you know what I think it is? It's because you miss playing PCs, so you're like, oh, I never get to do this. Oh, I, it's so fun to play a character. That's mostly what I do. So for me, it was like, oh, I get to come up with all these weird like mechanics and encounters and stuff like oh, that. So like that, that totally I think controlling the world was more interesting than creating characters, at least my first time around doing it because uh, because I create characters a lot and the new thing was creating the world. That makes a ton, a ton of sense. That makes a complete sense. Um, well, very, very exciting. Uh, uh, also, no, I won't, I won't spoil anything. But uh, uh, Emily and I had a very I had a conversation in which I think Emily maybe broke fifth edition D and D with a revelation into a certain spell casting loophole. That oh, I it's won't... already come out. It's already come out. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's already come out. I, you know what the thing was? I super fucked that up. Talking about challenge ratings, I like super fucked. I didn't fuck up because the final encounter. I just made way more effort for myself. I basically made this. I read somewhere that a um, that the challenge rating of a you can make a PC like uh, as an NPC just using the challenge rating like a quarter or a third of it. Yeah. So I made a sixteenth level wizard then created this amazing wizard layer um, filled with uh, a lots of glyphs containing spells. Then I sat back and I look at it and, and I was like, this is, this is for a, this is way too hard. <laughs> what have I done? This is bad advice. Um, so I used it very, very lightly. <laughs> God, cool, cool, cool. I love that. I, again, that's a very interesting thing. Now, I will say this. I almost exclusively play games that have six PCs. So the idea of anything ever being overpowered, I need to overturn the entire monster manual to even, like, slow <laughs> you guys down. I feel, you know that sequence in Disney's Hercules when Hades is just putting all the little monster tokens on the table and it just cuts <laughs> to Hercules absolutely fucking dominating and he's like, no! Ah! That's just me every season of Dimension 20. Okay. Well, um, I'll give you my encounter I made with a 16th level Chronergy wizard who made a simulacrum of herself, burned out all of her spells, then stepped on a glyph of warding with Tensor's transformation in it. Um, and it will destroy anyone. It's an insane encounter. Good. Honestly, good. Teach him a lesson. I don't know um, who would survive it. Oh <laughs> also, my. the idea of like, like sneaking up on a, like, a wizard who knows you're coming is going to be in inherently like the most overpowered encounter. That's the thing. If you're going to fight a wizard, you need to fight them <laughs> in less than eight hours from the yeah. moment they found out that you wanted to fight them or you're fucking They toast. are stocked with spells to just <laughs> like... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The, the whole act. Yeah. The preparation thing is that that's what wizards do, man. Don't give them eight hours. Yeah. Um, uh, incredible. Uh, well, we've been like blazing along. We have. We have. So- it's very funny that we like are starting our question segment so late because truly we've we have never before been deluged with uh, with questions uh, about gameplay and other stuff before like this on the Discord. Um, uh, uh, cool. Uh, uh, we'll start with this first one. Um, this first one comes to us from Emily is friend. Thanks, Emily is friend. Um, the question is, um, uh, here's the question. Uh, you're a really great DM, exclamation mark. Oh, um, uh, yeah. I'm learning. I'm <laughs> learning. Um, uh, and it goes on to say, um, how do you come up with such nice interactive spaces. Lots of DMs come up with cool battle mechanics, but your sense of place is so good, vivid and inspired. It makes me want to explore the world, especially that cottage. Where do you take inspiration? Uh, Where do you take inspiration? And how do you build such richness, especially in a very chaotic party? Yes, it was a very chaotic party, but Again, going back to what we were saying, I really liked DMing for a chaotic party. Like the more the shit they threw at me, that felt like presents and gifts, you know, for me to then uh, rewrap and give back to them. <laughs> um, how do I, I don't know. 
I guess like I really do like environments. I know that like uh, spoiler, this campaign went under the ocean, and so I learned a lot about the ocean. I think that when you're fighting with, I think that like setting up a fight, it was really good to use kind of like environmental layer actions was really fun, especially like when you're under underwater. Um, so that was just like, I think that really any, any terrain, even if you think that you're in a fantasy world, you can still like learn a lot about like, uh, about how actual environments function and get inspiration from that. Um, the cottage was kind of just like, I walked around like listening to um, really dreamy music and just pictured my fucking dream house <laughs> and then filled it and then filled it with, I went through and I looked at all the stupidest fucking items I could find. <laughs> There's so many good, stupid items out there. One of them is the staff of smiles, which I tried to get my players to get at like five different times and they never got it. All it is is a wand that you can make someone smile. And I was like, Oh, they would have the best time with that. I put it, and so I put it in the cottage. I put it in a giant clamshell under the ocean. I put it in like a arcane laboratory under the ocean, just always hoping they would find it. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I love that too. I think that there's like, well, this is also obvious because with Dimension 20, we have the amazing Rick Perry making battle sets for us. So we have to think about environment, but I am a huge, to me, if I if 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 someone made me choose between like you can only you can either only ever homebrew monsters uh, and all of your fights take place in static rooms or you can only use like official monsters but um, you always get to make your own battle location and environment I would go environment oh, ten out environment. of ten. Environment. Absolutely. I think the environment is so often what makes the fight memorable. Um, I agree. Because the players want to interact with the environment. If you tell them one little thing is going on, they'll use it to try and fight or do something. Like, they'll... They'll interact with it in some way. Sometimes even much to your detriment and... Uh, <laughs> God damn it, that fucking vulture. Um, uh, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. And because I think that that, the thing is this, right? Players want to, what do players want to do? Players want to feel like their character. They want to live inside a story. They want to make creative choices, right? And yes, your abilities are awesome and you want to do the optimal thing, but you still often want to add flavor to it from round to round and fight to fight. Immediately, I think about Sophie Bikes and the fucking rat chucks before Sophie <laughs> had key key empowered strikes. Um, it was like, it was like, how do I hurt these ghosts? Uh, these like these like good wraith cops. I know I'll grab two rats, tie them together by their tails, and now I have magic rat chucks because the rats <laughs> are enchanted. Beautiful, like I, that's great, and that's like an environmental thing, right? It's like, um, but I, I think that there's like a big advantage to those environmental fights because again, what a, like think about okay, in Dimension Twenty, there's six players. If there's a couple different kinds of monsters, you are probably going to be waiting like 40 minutes between your between turns in yeah. in, a, in a round of combat, right? When it gets to your turn, it, I think it can be so sad if you're like the optimal thing for me to do is to like walk straight forward and take my two attacks, right? Adding yeah. something like a skill challenge, you you have to balance. You're on an airship. You're on a yeah. runaway, you know, locomotive. There's some other thing going on. Like all of that can serve to make that one turn. You know, a player's going to take. Three, two to four turns during the average combat. How can you make those turns feel really special? Um, As a player, I also feel really engaged by um, by uh, fights where the environment is changing because you can't, you don't know what you're going to do on your turn. You have to watch everyone else's turn because the battlefield is always changing. You know, yeah. so it really keeps you on your toes. I think I also like. I, I liked from my you know limited experience of doing this. I really liked putting in elements either in fights or even just in role play that could go either way. Like, I think that part of, because I really like, I like 
being surprised. I liked having thing. I liked having a lot of things that I didn't know what way it was going to go. Yeah. Like I didn't know if the, if the characters were going to interact with this. I didn't know that if they would, if they did well, it would be good. If they did poorly, it would be bad. This is a, uh, you know, like I liked, I really liked things that could be manipulated by the players. Cause it made the story, uh, it made me be watching the story as it happened as well, which was really fun. A hundred percent. And and to the advice that this person is asking for, I think you can find your inspiration for how to like spice those mechanics up almost anywhere. Like one of the examples I think about was like the Broadway, spoilers for Unsleeping City season one, but like the Broadway fight where it's like, oh, what if we built a whole battle around performance checks? What if we built a whole battle around yeah. some other weird kind of skill challenge? And you can kind of do that with anything because I think what that does too is if you're playing with people who are really seasoned, it gets you, and I'm very guilty of this. Like when I made Dead Eye, he was very, very optimized. And and at, what happens as a result of that is um, you end up going like, I think even very good players can feel trapped by knowing what the best thing to do all the time is. And when you add some X factor of here's this skill challenge, here's this banter going on, you allow people to be like, oh, I'm not in my comfort zone. I do need to think creatively. Like maybe, yeah. you know, exactly. Um, yeah, I think also like, I, I think that um, most of the battles that I that I did for this little mini campaign, like they all, like I wouldn't approach the fight like, oh, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do, do damage or what's gonna be challenging? I kind of approached with almost like a theme. It's like, you know, the final battle is like, what would a fucking wizard who's waiting for you, what kind of shit would they get up to? There was one battle that I just took a bunch of like real life, um, underwater animals and put them in, flavored them as like different spells as lair actions. You know, there was one battle that like the whole kind of objective was like, oh, your scuba suits might get fucked up. Uh, and like, yeah. that's like the scary X factor. So it's like, it was fun, like in terms of thinking of the battle, it was always like, well, what's, what's like the challenge of this battle? And then I'll fill in the pieces, you know? Yes, I love that. Um, uh, uh, that's great. Starting challenge first is, I think, a really great way to go about it. And I think something, again, too, is players love choices and making choices and having those choices yeah. matter. And when you add different axes, like adding one or two small elements to a fight can exponentially multiply the amount of choices that are being made. Oh yeah. So you if go you like, just have like one thing that they could discover that could have a huge effect, like that is so exciting as a player. Oh yeah. And it's as simple as like, okay, here's a straightforward fight. Here's the monsters, here's their powers. We're gonna add one skill challenge to that, which is like, hey, like the, the terrain is falling away as this island crumbles or whatever. And then if you add one other thing of like, also, uh, you know, there's this object here, which you can like break and it will do something. All of a sudden as a player, that those three things multiply by each other into becoming like, you know, nine, 20, whatever amount of choices you can make of like, okay, yeah. I'm gonna focus on stopping the environment. I'm gonna focus on getting the <laughs> object. I'm gonna focus on, uh, and you end up having a very fun time indeed. Um, uh, uh, we got another one. This one is from uh, Pretty Farut Man. Thanks, Pretty Farut Man. Um, uh, the question is, you are such an inspiration. Uh, both of our questions thus far have started with uh, uh, exclamations. <laughs> you are such oh, an I inspiration. Thought it, I thought that was for you. Uh, no, that's for you. Uh, 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 you are such an inspiration. Anytime I'm playing a TTRPG and come to a crossroads, I think to myself, what would Emily Axford do? In that vein, I've heard that part of how you play so well is that you take meticulous notes, can verify. Um, can you talk about your note-taking strategy? I find that I either write down everything and end up disengaged from RP and unable to find useful things later, or I just give up and don't write anything, then forget stuff later. Teach me your ways, <laughs> exclamation mark. So I take notes because I, I, it helps me engage, you know, like it helps me stay. It's not even as much like 
oh, I'm going to crack this case. It's like sometimes I take the notes because it's like a helpful listening tool. Um, but really, I just write down a name. I write down like, like I, I, my notes, if you read them, if you look at them, it's like lots of like single disembodied, uh, you know, I never write down sentences. I just write down, oh, wait, like something paradox. What was that about? Or like sometimes I'll take a note that's like, I need to talk to that person. I remember like I was really, really, uh, I remember being like, really convinced us, Sophie, that I needed to talk to my grandma about uh, about God or something, because there was the Lazarus stuff, which it re- which it related to Emma Lazarus. But I was like, there must be some undead necromancery. They're laundering souls. I'm sure of it. I'll talk to my grandma, who is undoubtedly religious. I live in Staten Island. And then it- <laughs> so it's like, I remember writing down, like, talk to grandma or talk to my mom or something like that. Can I, I um, want to share something here, which is I have never been more powerfully tempted to fully change a campaign that I've written than when Sophie came up with soul laundering. <laughs> you said that, and in my head I was like, pretty fucking cool, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty fucking cool. Shit. Like, um, because that was when I make a big guess and it's super wrong. I'm always like, whoops. Uh. <laughs> no, but that's the horror is like. Not me as a person. <laughs> oh, God. No, it was so funny when you said that. I was like, is it too late to just make it that? Um, uh, so, yeah, so, so the notes I'll take are like kind of just like, you know, if your teacher is saying like, um, uh, you know, in class, if your teacher is saying like, ah, yes, the the tome of uh, Leviticus was found in uh, Assyria. Okay, I'm so sorry for how wrong all of that was. You would write down tome of Leviticus and Assyria. You know. Right. You're not. You're not recording this for anyone other than yourself. So it's like you're That's flat. Not a word will trigger the entire thing. Or a lot of times, a lot of times the sessions will start before we start rolling. I'll be like, hey, Brennan, I wrote this down. What's that? <laughs> Every time you have done that, it has been some incredibly crucial plot thing. And I have like wiped sweat off. I'm like, thank fucking God. It's so <laughs> fun. Well, I'm here. Can I, I'm going to share something. Take that- less notes so that you can stay more engaged. And then you can just ask your DM at the top, like, I I don't understand this note. And your DM will be like, this is what the note meant. Yes, exactly. And that's also helpful, too, because then the DM can kind of, like, not massage, but, like, go, oh, like, give you the right information to get your character going in the direction they need to be headed in. True story. Uh, uh, this, is, this is, I'm actually going to confess to something on here. I... Uh, all of the PC journals for Dimension 20 are kept in these little totes that Rick Perry holds onto in the room where all the sets are kept. Emily's note taking is so good that I have often been able to see if I was on the rails or not by sneaking into the production <laughs> office. This is a tr- <laughs> okay, but I read, see, I read secrets and I read notes. Okay, I'm gonna my characters are having too. That's private, Brennan. It's not a fucking journal, baby. Those those notebooks belong to the show, baby. That's Dimension 20 property, okay? That's like working on a company computer, all right? Um, <laughs> uh, true, but I, I'll go through and I'll open things up and be like, did anyone catch that little lore dump? Did anyone catch it? Like, yes, here it is. Okay, great. Whew. And then I know I don't need to mention it again. I don't need to be like, that same old man wanders into the tavern and says, anyway, yeah, the old dragon lord, as I was saying. Like, I can go like, great, hey, they clocked it, good. Um, I, also, I also have a, like, really, really, um, a really terrible memory. Like, a a uh, comically terrible memory. Uh, so I have to take notes or I won't remember anything that happened two days ago, you know? So it's like, (laughs) it's like kind of like, I need to sit down, go through all my little notes just to be like, ah, yes, I remember all this now. Otherwise I'm just like, all I remember is the car ride here. (laughs) (laughs) Truly, no, it's, it's, I I think it's like a very wise thing to do. It's super helpful all around, I think, to, to have that note taker, because I have Wolfina's five-year plan. I took notes for um, for our home game, and then we at one point because we were playing three point five. At one point, you started giving us like peaks of like uh, what kind of classes and stuff were ahead, and then I wrote down a little five-year plan for Wolfina. 
God, I love that. A, a necessary thing to do back in 3.5. Absolutely. Um, uh, incredible. Um, uh, uh, we'll jump into another question here. Um, uh, this one's from Reese. Thanks, Reese. Um, tell us all about your dice rituals. I am very curious because I will... <laughs> Because I roll like shit, and it needs to stop. Uh, thanks, okay. Reese. I'm going to tell you all about my dice rituals. I've spoken about this before. Everyone knows I'm a fucking dice nut. Okay? I'm a dice nut. This is a fucking pathetic thing is right now, we're about to start a new campaign for NADPOD. I'm in, a, I'm in a room surrounded by all of my dice on their highest integer. <laughs> <laughs> because oh I need God. to find out. I have, I mean, I probably have at least eight sets right now because I'm deciding which dice will be. I believe that the ones that I'm going to use for this new character have spoken to me. Um, but my very specific ritual is I like to have a couple sets for a character. And then I like to start out, I like to, at the beginning of the session, roll all of them. And you got to roll to see one who's rolling hot and one who's rolling spicy. So that the dice get my attention if they roll a 20, but they also get my attention if they roll a one. Cause I like to have someone like rolling interesting in there. So that's what, so my ritual is, I like to have like a couple different sets so that I can, before I play this session, uh, roll them all to see who's rolling the most interesting. Ooh, the, yeah. I love that. Rolling the most interesting. That yeah. feels very, very special. I want all 20s. I want, I want some, I want some fucking twos in there. <laughs> Hell yes. Um, I love that. There's that, I had that, that theory when I was a kid. I also do rest on the highest integer always. Um, but in my head, I, I explained it to myself as being like, Plastic is slightly morphable or, or, or malleable, right? Uh, uh, it's not it's not a pure like metallic solid. So over time, you know, as the plastic rests, that bottom number, usually being the one on twenty sided die, gets slightly heavier and fatter as the plastic sort of settles into it. This is what I tell myself. So when I you roll the die. This is where you're very logical and I am that shit because I'm just like. I got to teach them. <laughs> I got to make them most comfortable in this position. If they like being on 20, if that's their stasis, they'll go there more often. I'm developing a rapport, a connection. <laughs> Me and the guys, we're in this together. <laughs> but you know what? All roads lead to Rome. And, you know, <laughs> all you of go. them are stupid. They do nothing. I know <laughs> they do nothing. Um, I am aware that they do nothing, but it like makes me feel more connected to the dice. Holding some dice that I feel like in tune with before I play makes me feel really amped to play. So like that's probably the real purpose of the ritual. I think so. And I think also that it's an insurance policy because the thing we know we don't want to grapple with is that the dice are these truly uncaring alien entities. So when you do these rituals, you and you roll well, you're like I'm gonna take the credit for that good roll because I did my rituals correctly. And if it rolls like shit, you go like, I'm fucking up these rituals somehow. Like I'm not doing, I'm not doing the, but notice both ways you're still in control and that feels better yeah. than the terrible truth, which is that the dice are our are overlords and that they command our fates and our destiny. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, oh no. Um, moving on to another question here. I want to try to get as many of these in as I we did, can. Oh, I did though, when I, when I DM'd, I cooked my dice in the opposite way. I call it cooking when I put them on their highest integer. I put them on their lowest integer for the dice that I deal with. How, that's so friendly to do that. I, that's very, how sweet for your players. Um, uh, <laughs> this one comes to us from Kestrel. Shout out to Kestrel. Uh, hey guys! Yeah, uh, uh, a dual a dual fandom mod squad, Kestrel. Shout out to Kestrel. Um, uh, uh, what's it like making the transition from long-term player to DM, and what advice do you have for people interested in also doing that? Uh, my advice is that you should absolutely fucking do it. It's so fun. It's like, I mean, I suppose I really like work, but like, it's just, it's, it's work, but it's so much fun and you learn, it, it, it's so much fun to set up 
things that you know your friends are going to interact with in a really fun way. (laughs) So I guess like, what is the transition? The transition is that I'm still like, that I'm like, definitely like coming at it. I'm thinking all the time, what's the most fun for a PC. So like, you know, like there's things that are, are fun, but like not as fun that I haven't had the guts to quite do yet. Um, uh, so I'm definitely still like, uh, yeah, I, I think that, I think that it's like, it's not as, it's not as intimidating. I think as people think it's like, it's, it's work, but it's also just kind of like creating spaces for your friends to play. I don't think you need to approach it. Like I must come in with my treatise and tell my story. I think you should approach it. Like I, like I the like just asking your friends, what do you want to do? What kind of world do you want to play in? Make the world around them. Like, I, I'm sure that there are people who are like, no, I have a specific world I want to do. Um, and I, I totally understand that. But for me, it was very much like, it, I think it makes it less intimidating. If you're, if your goal is for your friends to have fun and not for you to become some great artist, then it's so much less intimidating. intimidating. Yeah. That's such a great way to put it too. And I do think the things that I think of DMing as being the most like is it's kind of one of those acts of service that friends do for each other in a lot of different contexts, like baking cookies for your friends. Like, oh, we're gonna go like hang out later. I'm gonna make a baked good for everybody. In that same vein, do you, I feel like every friend I've ever known that like bake stuff for people will show up with like delicious cookies and it'll be like, oh my God, they're so good. And they're like, oh, I didn't put enough salt. There'll be some little self-criticism. Yeah. <laughs> It's always in your head. Do you know how bad a free cookie needs to get for me to even <laughs> like, like you will be great. You will be fucking yeah. great. Um, and also like, your friends will totally understand. Like in the beginning, like you're going to be like, fuck, I don't remember what, I don't remember what incapacitated means. Let me look that up. You don't need to know everything. You can look that up, figure it out, then come back to the game. Like you don't have to be, perfect. Um, and yeah, again, I, I still, I just think that like the more you think of it as like creating a world for other people to play in and less like, this is my Lord of the Rings, yes. <laughs> then it, you are going to have so much more fun and, and probably end up doing more creative stuff because there yeah. won't be a, a burden of expectation on yourself. I think that's incredibly wise and, and important for people to hear because you got to get out there and do the damn thing. Um, it's also uh, such a good story. When 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 other people are helping you tell the story, it's so much more interesting. I found it. I also found it to be. I think if I was coming in there being like, "This is my Lord of the Rings," I don't think I would have found it interesting at all because, like, I never did stand up. I mean, I did do stand up when I was really really young, but like, I didn't like it because I didn't like telling the same joke twice. It felt so boring. And so, like, yeah. if I wrote something and then it just played out as I wrote it, I would be like, I already wrote this. Why do I need to watch this happen again? You know? So it's like, they're the most interesting element of it to me. So. Uh, Total agreement. Um, uh, uh, I think we maybe have time for one more question. Um, uh, This one comes to us from uh, Lais. Uh, Thank you, Lais. Um, Hi. Uh, the two of you are always very impressive with world building, both as DMs and with Emily as a player as well. Shout out to the crack. Um, uh, how should a DM go about encouraging their players to do that world building? And how would a player inform their DM that that might be something they're interested in doing without being afraid they'll mess up the DM's vision of the world? Thank you so much. I think that you can just like have a rapport. I mean, like, I definitely know that like with NADPOD, we'll, we'll improvise a lot. And sometimes more uh, like, uh, definitely Caldwell will always be like, is there a, is there a, um, is there a Dunkin' Donuts nearby? <laughs> I'll just like, say some batshit joke. And sometimes Murph is like, yeah, you know what, there is. And it ends up being really funny. And then other times we just jokingly is like, no, there's not. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like having that rapport to know that you can shout out stuff. And if it works with the DM, they'll be like, cool, let's run with it. And if it doesn't, you know, they'll just be like, come on now. I think that's really what it comes down to is, first of all, um, this is, so there's a, there's a complex thing going on in this question, which is like, on the one hand, 
I think players get rightfully nervous about <laughs> their their stepping on a part of world design that yeah. might fuck up something that the DM has planned. The closest we got to that, I, I think, think back to- I do get nervous about that. Yeah, I go back to thinking about um, the closest we ever got to that, because to me, the improviser in me always wants to yes and player world building. But we've gotten close sometimes. The closest we got in season one of Fantasy High was Beardsley out of left field being like, oh, I went to the Harvest Man camp when I was a kid, which is <laughs> because in my head, I was like, OK, if this if this this could get to a point, if Beardsley goes like. I am a harvest man currently, I will have to lean across the table and be like, no, you're not. Like, or, or one of those <laughs> things of being like, no, 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 no. Like these are very, very bad people. But, um, but that's an example of something that I think successfully skirted the line without crossing it. Of Because then it allowed Chris and Applebee's to be like, oh my God, I like, I went to this cult when I was a kid. My parents sent me to a cult camp and it like had all this great weight behind it. But I think that players get nervous around things like that sometimes more than they need to, which it really just, what I love about Moonshine and Campaign One of NADPOD is the degree of authority that Moon, it, it's basically the same thing you would do if you were making a sand castle with someone where it's like, I see the part of the sandcastle you are not actively building right now, and that's where I'm going to go build. Rather yeah. than, you know, rather than seeing like, like if a DM is like narrating the arrival of a new villain, and you're like, oh, I fucking know that guy. That's my dad. And you're like, like what? <laughs> like, yeah. oh wait, I didn't like you when you're building a sandcastle with people you work collaboratively, but that doesn't always mean that you're putting your hands on the exact part of the sandcastle that someone else yeah. built. That's a very good point because like I was able to improvise about the crick because we weren't at the crick and we weren't gonna be for a little bit. So it's like, I could throw out a bunch of shit and I knew that Murph would take what worked for him. But once we got to the crick, I wasn't like, I wasn't like, hey, where's the snow cone stand? Actually, probably <laughs> would have been okay with that. <laughs> but, but like, you know, like that might have put, it was more like, this is just happening. It was like, it was like adding to, it was kind of almost like helping build a space that we were going to go to eventually, but hadn't been yet. But my character had role play reasons to know that, you know? And I think too, that what's, what's great there is if you look at like what, what are the underlying kind of like guidelines or principle under that? It's like, it's incredible. Like what would have been lost if you didn't have the authority to make those choices in the moment is like not only the richness of the crick when you got there as a setting, but also all the moments of Moonshine speaking with authority about her own homeland and establishing her character through this familiarity. It would have really sucked if you had to keep checking in with Murph about like, hey, yeah. can this be true about the Crick before I shoot off this zinger? Like, yeah. God, what a fucking like weight around your ankles that would have been. Um, like, and also you could know, like if you're improvising in that context, like you can just be like building it and and trust that you won't hold them to some one offhand joke that you make. In fact, what will definitely happen is if you make an offhand joke and they're like, eh, that's not true about the Crick, they won't say anything. And then when you go to the Crick, it won't be there. Yeah. <laughs> and you won't remember you said it anyways. <laughs> I so. love it. Um, but yeah, I think that the, 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 the guidelines that really work are, look, the things that DMs are worried about getting stepped on are usually like things related to the schemes of their villains and the plots that are kind of moving around. And insofar as those relate to things that have to do with world building, like cosmology and stuff, I think it's about using your best judgment around like um, taking like, taking big swings around the things that feel familiar to your character to begin with. Like yeah. I'm trying to think of like what could even be improvised, like, you know, it, like improvising big. Oh, I know something that was improvised. What's that? That Murph didn't use. I, <laughs> I really wanted, I was like, I think I maybe like referenced that like Moonshine was unique because she was, uh, born alone whereas usually like uh crick elves are born in litters 
<laughs> he did not run with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I oh think about God. that. Yeah. That's, so that's yeah. That, like, I don't think in the moment he was not like, he wasn't like, no, you weren't. I think he just let that be a weird joke. And then we didn't incorporate that. <laughs> it was really funny. I remember improvising a few things as Dead Eye that Murph was really great about because I, I specifically, like, in his backstory, he was supposed to be this person who had, like, been around and adventured and met a lot of people and yada, yada. Like, I think the only people that he had not interacted with were like Thiala and Ulfgar because he'd been dead for too long at that point. But like the older crew of Bohemia adventurers, like the Stormborns and you know people like that, like he had interacted with them before. But it was funny because suddenly you're in that moment and you're like, oh, if I can't speak with some authority, I'm not gonna even sound regular. Because people yeah. don't say like, I've interacted with your parents. They say like, I partied on the SS Stormborn. You don't have time to like confirm those details with a DM before you'll, your character will sound totally bizarre. So the truth is like- That was definitely intimidating as Saccharina because it's like, we had this backstory that she'd been sailing around the Dairy Sea and gone to the Meatlands and stuff like that. But then it's like, once we were in game, it was like, well, uh, I I do I do know some people in the Meatlands, but uh, I, don't I don't know their names. Uh, I, don't. <laughs> I think that's very real, and I think that that it's very different. Improvising shit in Fantasy High is going to feel way different than improvising shit in Crown of Candy or Unsleeping City. Yeah, because Crown because of Candy the, was like such a carefully a carefully uh, precarious web. And it's like, I didn't want to, like, if it was like Fig, it'd be like, yeah, I know him. <laughs> yeah. But like Saccharina was like, yes, I do know someone. <laughs> I'll let Brennan bring that up if that's what he's been. If he's not, okay, no, okay, bye. <laughs> um, but that's, I think that's a very fun thing is like, but I also think that world building can happen at the table, but it can also happen in between sessions. Like I love a little, a good little lore dump for a character in yeah. between sessions. And I also love that thing of like, making backstory um uh but I, and i also think too of like deputizing players where if a player is like i'm part of an order of knights or whatever you as a dm absolutely should be like come up with your code i don't need to do that yeah. it's like come up with your code um it, it also happened um uh the uh, the parents in fantasy high were were I think characterized by me, but cast by the players. Like my character, the players said, I do or don't have siblings. Here's who my mother and father are. Um, yeah. You know, like that stuff I think is very critical for players to be the ones to world build that stuff. One um, thing I also learned from you is like, even in the moment, I feel like it's uh, that you always did a really good job that I have never, uh, that I, I tried to do when I DM'd is like, asking like sometimes like a, a player will be like oh i uh i shoot my fireball at them and you are always like okay cool what does like your fireball look like and then yes. you as the player are like well <laughs> <laughs> what does it look like it looks like a phoenix erupting from my shoulder where it lives i have a phoenix that i can expend as a <laughs> fireball and so i tried to do that and it was really fun uh, being on the other side of that and seeing all of the cool things that people came up with just from simply saying like, hey, instead of me telling you how this happens, how do you want this to happen? Yes, I really, I, I dig that so, so much. Um, oh man, we are we are over time right now. Uh, <laughs> what a fucking ball. I feel like there's so much good advice in this episode. Uh, uh, Emily, as always, what a goddamn joy uh, to chat about D and D for two hours. Wonderful, um, <laughs> wonderful. wonderful. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Again, I feel like the, the, any plugs we would do is absolutely crazy because if you're watching this, you fucking watch NADPOD. Yeah. And if you don't, you absolutely <laughs> should. Um, uh, but uh, uh, check out NADPOD uh, campaign two. When, when does when does campaign, campaign two starts October fifth? Um, and you can also go listen to, um, uh, we called it the Mavericks Chronicles was the little thing I did for, um, but it was unofficially called Hot Boy Summer, actually because uh, Kess DM'd me and was like, hey, um, we've been calling it Hot Boy Summer, by the way. And I was like, duly noted, that's a better name. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, incredible. 
Uh, check out Hot Boy Summer, a.k.a. The Mavericks Chronicles <laughs> and Camping 2 for Nad Pod. Emily Axford, a joy, a privilege, and an honor, as always. Uh, thank you so much. Hell yeah. <laughs> and we'll catch y'all next time on Adventuring Academy. Bye-bye! Bye-bye!